<laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to season three, episode four of Inside the Rookery. I'm not running late. You're running late, is what we shall take <laughs> this one. Um, we are going to talk about dark fantasy. All of the Parliament have flown in to have um, a chat about it. So, hello, everyone. Hello, hello. viewers alike. I shall not give introductions because everyone hopefully should know us, but I will just wish around to myself. Yes. Sorry, for the side of us, each other. Sorry. Yes. Smooth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Moving swiftly on this week in an exciting <laughs> move, I'm going to be doing the banners, which are the pre submitted questions, and Andy Lacey is going to be handling the comments and bringing them up for me to read. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> um, as always, um, you can join us on our Patreon or you can jump onto our Discord server for exciting community chat about all things RPG, fantasy, sci-fi, movies, TV, film, whatever you like. And Food. if there's something we don't have a channel for, we will make a channel for if it is popular enough. So, I yeah, Andy is going to be handling you Long Shadow Games. I'm sorry about oh, that. Yeah. Oh, which Andy? Oh. It's a mystery. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So first up is a question, reliably, from Kilishandra, who asks, what is dark fantasy for you? Who wants to go first tonight? A rare moment oh, of silence. I mean, it's always me. Does it have to be me again? <laughs> That's the first time I've heard you complain about it. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> the complaints come rolling in. Uh... Well, I'll go if you like. Um, the uh, original heroic fantasy of D&D &D was based on a mixture of Tolkien and 1950s Prince Valiant and similar Hollywood medieval movies. And it was all rather shiny and rather bland and rather two-dimensional. So fast forward... Uh, I mean, it, it was behind the times even when Dungeons and Dragons came out in 1973, because we had Roger Zelazny and uh, the Philip Jose Farmer and various other people writing a more a meatier kind of fantasy. And um, so, you know, fast forward to the mid 80s and we've had punk go by. We've got a general sort of uh, feeling of, of disillusionment and cynicism and um, and the old uh, sort of bland, two-dimensional, uh, morally uh, unambiguous fantasy just wasn't cutting it anymore. Mm. And that's my view. Yeah. <clears throat> I was a great fan of fantasy of all stripes when I was a kid. I consumed and read everything. Um, I read uh, high fantasy, like, say, David Eddings' The Belgariad, completely daft, over the top, and it worked very well for a kid. Um, yeah. But as I grew older, um, my personal taste grew, let us say, more to the darker side, largely because most of the higher fantasy just didn't feel real. Exactly. And the darker stuff in general kind of did. And I also missed, which is often... An undercurrent to many dark fantasies, particularly ones I've worked on, um, the, the satire that often mm. came hand in hand with it. It wasn't just fantasy that was being churned out for pulpy reasons. Um, it was it had a message underlying the general storyline that may be going across. Um, or if you went down say the Murkokian versions of the darker fantasies, often there was a philosophical underpinning. Yeah. There was something being said where the mm. high fantasy stories were often just that. Yeah. They were stories for the sake of stories. Um, and whilst they were super enjoyable for what they were, they weren't, in the end, what did it for me. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit like, um, I suppose, like dystopia, right? That, you know, dystopia is not just like a, a random sci-fi in which everything is bad. Um, the, the, you know, it's it's much more about the, the, the time in which it's written than, than anything else, right? So like 1984 yeah. was written in 1948 and it's very much about the political things that Orwell saw at that point and mm. imagined it into the future and the, the same with like say Atwood and, and The Handmaid's Tale or whatever. And I suppose dark fantasy is the, sort of the fantasy equivalent of, of that. 
um, of of taking a, a a problem in society, a problem in with behavior or with the world or, or whatever, and, and kind of exaggerating that out into this hellscape uh, in, in which you can actually play. So is yeah, that what defi- is that what defines dark fantasy? I mean, obviously, it's not just fantasy with the lights off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, that. Do um, not do not Google that, by the way. But does it have to have that 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 sort of that that um, those deeper underpinnings, or can it just be no. dark, no. scary, and menacing versions can, of the it, 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 Yeah, it can, and you know, there's uh, also at that time I forgot to mention that um, uh, hard rock and heavy metal were discovering fantasy motifs in a big way, and there was a huge cross pollination there absolutely uh you know uh dio and uh many many of his darker comrades but um so that sort of cross pollination also produced a kind of what you might call a gonzo version of dark fantasy which has sort of wound us up with the likes of mork borg and uh, mm-hmm. lamentations of the flame princess it's interesting that oil painting said just there that they remember with first edition as being a breath of fresh air because oh, for okay. some people yeah it's sweet <laughs> isn't it but for but like for me although i had played D, it was like as a primary school child i didn't really get into it didn't really understand what role playing was but my first then real fantasy role play experience was with rip first edition so for me it wasn't so much a breath of fresh air as literally the first thing i engaged with when i was a teenager when i was mm. ready to like you're a teenager right you think you're so serious and so <laughs> profound mm. and you're just ready to like be grown up about things and 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 I found <laughs> yeah um which is interesting i think um no, I, yeah, I, I, someone I else yeah. yeah um got, yeah. coming from D, which was quite quite i mean you, certainly the D i was playing and the rune quest i was playing we sort of tended tended to sort of uh, create our own universes for that our own our own scenarios yeah. our own our own backdrops and sometimes that was because we were teenage lads it, it was often sort of light-hearted and flippant and then Wolfram comes along and oh it's, yeah and, and it's a and it's a grounded universe so i think yeah there's a darkness and, and there's this kind of a mm. Uh, uh, you could. I didn't feel that you could afford to be very casual or flippant in in the Wolfram universe. You didn't last long if you did. <laughs> <laughs> no. And interestingly, we then moved on from. We'd played Wolfram for a bit, and then we went it straight. We went to Vampire, but we went to Vampire the Dark Ages and had this epic campaign. And actually, Vampire the Dark Ages was much more akin to playing a dark fantasy game than mm. it was that modern horror or that, you, you know, the Vampire Chronicles that you have in modern day. There was still, you know, the element of the Fae were still there. And there was a lot of elements of dark fantasy in mm in our Dark Ages game that we then came to kind of recognise and replay when we went back to Wifrup in its second edition later. And that was quite interesting. My abiding memory of moving from Dark Ages to Wifrup is having to imagine things in the daytime because we've spent like yeah. five years imagining our role playing at night and going up to town, you know, to towns and being like, gates are closed again. Like who's gonna <laughs> present them? Who's gonna dominate them? Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, being able to just walk into a town was quite refreshing and, and somewhat less dark when we moved back to Warfrop. But certainly like I think I don't think dark fantasy is only in the realms of fictional fantasy worlds. I think there can be elements well, of dark of fantasy course. in any game that you play. Oh yeah. I mean I mean arguably if you're playing anything that's sort of in the sort of gothic horror genre. I guess yeah. that that is sort of dark fantasy, isn't it? It's it's it's, it's one it's, ancestor, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there was another comment asking. Um, I don't know if you can bring it up again, Andy. The one where they said, "Is dark fantasy more grounded in reality?" And uh, and yeah, and it sounds counterintuitive, right? But actually, for me, the dark fantasy games I've played, whether they've been you know Vampire Dark Ages or with they are more grounded in reality. In that, Mark, what you were saying is there are real consequences that feel real. You know, you don't kill something and get XP and some gold. You kill mm. something mm. and something happens. And right. and and if you're mm. rude to someone, something happens. You can't be that flippant. Mm. You can be flippant around the table. You can't necessarily be as flippant in the world. I'm not yeah. sure that's necessarily the case for all dark fantasy games, particularly when we move now over into, say, video games. There are many mm-hmm. dark fantasy video games that are unrelievingly dark, are unrelievingly fantasy, 
and most certainly are not grounded in reality. They're mm. all focusing on the horror, the grim, the darkness of whatever yeah. that particular setting may be. And mm. whilst my preference is not for that unrelieving pressure, because if you have that, then the darkness actually loses, for my personal tastes, a lot of its darkness. Yes, um, if everything's dark. Nothing... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. why games like, say, say, some games that are unrelievingly dark, I'll give them, um, oh, like, say, Darkest Dungeon. That's a really yeah. quick game for those of you who played it. But it starts <laughs> off by saying, you're going there from somewhere else that isn't like this. And then you go off the cliff. Hmm. Um, uh, it's all about the contrasts, for me at least. Right. I mean, it's, Do you remember? It, it, sorry, Andy. Like, you well, I was just going to say that. Obviously, a famous example of that would be all the From Software games. Um, are like good examples of that, and I, oh, oh. I just can't get on with them. I just don't. I just don't like them. I, I find them too, too monotone in that darkness. Um, I don't, right. and I, I don't find them grounded at all. Mm. I find them too fantastical, and mm. that therefore makes the darkness just feel, I don't know, yeah. arbitrary. For some reason, they just don't speak to me. I, I know There's millions a... love them, but. Yeah. yeah. There's a I game think... Legacy of King. Do you do you remember oh, that game? Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> yes. I know so that, it's like on that. Un- oh, unrelievingly wow. grim and there's always like the yeah. the soundtrack is like wolves howling and people screaming and then at one point in the game he literally says like I heard <laughs> yeah, the sound of someone yeah. screaming. Yeah. It was yeah. yeah, I was pleased because that meant someone somewhere was suffering more than i and we come back to that because it just like it was a touch of humor like overblown humor yeah. in the midst of this grimness that i thought like that's perfect that yeah. for me is dark fantasy i think the the better dark fantasy is grounded in the reality of human nature it's always you know the the best dark fantasy to me points out that uh, that mortals humans people call them what you will they are the greatest monsters of all yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I think that works well for me too. As long as there's a grimly monster in there as a servant or something. As long oh, as yeah, I, yeah. Rather than not just drawing sinister humans the whole time. Well, you know, <laughs> other, otherwise it's just the news at 10, isn't it? Yeah. Well, God, yeah. That's true. <laughs> but that's, that, you know, that, you don't, you don't that, need to go yeah. fantasy for darkness. You know? yeah. yeah. But that's the great sleight of hand that you, you can pull with dark fantasy, isn't it? Is that you can introduce something that looks monstrous, but mm. actually isn't. Uh, yeah. And then actually the things that look human and normal, that's actually where the evil is. And you, and you can have your big, yeah, yeah, but... tremendous creatures, but they're not actually the the, the real existential threat. It's, it's something else. So. It's quite yeah. it's the difference between, say, the force of nature, the thing which is what it is, and nothing more. And like, you don't blame a cat for scratching you. That's just what cats I do. do. And the same way, you don't blame <laughs> demons for doing demonical things. It's all the people around them and the way they're using these creatures or trying no, to bring I them think, towards no, well, I know alien. I know what you're saying, but I do think demons have... Perhaps it's about time to start taking responsibility. For the <laughs> 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 not very well and good blaming the high priests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, too. They're... Yeah, they're they're not going to go to their 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 hell and sit and think about what they've done. No, they're not. <laughs> Too busy dancing and going, yeah, I'm a demon. <laughs> oil, painting, oil pointing, oil painting. Who said the tapestry of Wifrit careers helped set the tone? The mundanity, yeah, yeah. mundanity. I don't know how to say that. Of some yeah. of the careers helped them to highlight the grimness of the world: executioner or torturer, except or mm-hmm. rat catcher with a small but vicious dog. <laughs> <laughs> yep yep definitely and that was that was something we definitely wanted to uh be anti-heroic and uh you know present ordinary people faced with threats and what would they do because uh, you know if everybody's a huge powerful something or other then it's just boring yeah so i've got a question yeah, 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 yeah. i'm sorry I've got a question for the panel, which I've just decided I'm going to ask, because why shouldn't I? I am the hostess. Um, so you have you ever worked on something that was kind of like fantasy, but then you kept on, because I think we're all quite drawn to that like darkness and that grim humour, and you kept on trying to bring that in, whether it was your concept art or your writing, and, and the IP owner had to say, like, can you, just, can you just dial it back a bit? Can you just keep it a little bit lighter? That's pretty much the story of Wolfram at First Edition because uh, <laughs> the uh, the management at Games Workshop basically wanted a British version of D and D, uh, and so when we started doing what we were doing, uh, all these jokes are childish. Take them out. 
um, you can't have this, you can't have that. So the whole development, the whole first four or five years of Wolf at First Edition up through Flame consisted of a sort of a running battle with the, the, the censors, as it were. We were seeing what we could get away with, what we could sneak in, what they'd miss. And uh, I think that went a long way towards uh, making Wolf at First Edition what it was. It's similar in some ways to the British innuendo comedy of the 50s and 60s, where they were always trying to, to get, get away with whatever they could without triggering the censors. Interesting. Anyone yeah, else? I'm, have I'm, you, trying you... To, I'm, I'm trying to think. There must there must have been some stuff at um, uh, at Blizzard. There must have been some stuff on WoW that, that where, where it was like. I think it's certainly tonally trying trying to get some some dark. There was soon when I was working on Cataclysm. I remember we were, we were uh, developing the, the starting area for the Worgen. Who who were your classic um, uh, sort of uh, romantic werewolf you know, cursed cursed uh, uh, people. Um, and, and, and throat trying to and shoehorning in as much of that of that sort of dark gothic romance as possible in there. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall there being much resistance to it, but it's kind of just kind of okay, how much of this can we can we embrace and how much of it will, will the players appreciate and what can we do with it? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's always a drive, I think, to to put that sort of to to, to, to add sufficient flavour that what you're giving is not just a, a variety of your mm. bog standard fantasy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, that, there's a question well, here. Sorry, Graham, when you go. I was just going to say, while while that sort of tension is uh, is important, uh, you know, if if it's completely unrestricted and people are allowed to go as dark as they like, we end up with in the position that Vampire was in a couple of years ago, where it uh, got very very edge lordy, and uh, you know, you need you need someone to, to draw a line, even if. It, yep. you know, to kick against uh well, I've got, well that leads us nicely onto this question from long shadow so when is dark too dark dark fantasy covers a range of uncomfortable material are there any subjects that you consider no-go zones and how do you handle them if they're unavoidable i'll just jump in from from my perspective and say for me dark fantasy isn't like a fantasy world that has necessarily like racism and sexism and all of those like edge lord mm -hmm. behaviors because actually that's not what makes dark fantasy dark for me and but i think in terms of uncomfortable material um the perspectives are different. I, I answered this question a, a few weeks ago and someone else on the panel chipped in to say, well, actually, from my perspective, I like X because I like to be able, even though I might experience that in the real world, to experience it in a fantasy game and have the powers and the tools to overcome it. And I find that quite mm. cathartic. Whereas someone else, like when I first started playing Wifrup with Andy Law, I was like, don't you dare tell me that my character can't be X, Y or Z because they're a woman because I'm not having it. I get that at work and I don't want it in my free time. Like today, I might say something differently, but at that point in my life, there were things mm. going on in my life that made me go, do you know what? I don't want that right now. And, and that's great. Like that's your session zero, your discussion as a group, your talk about how what things make you uncomfortable or not. And actually having a safe enough group that you don't need to have covered it all in advance, but during it, you can just say, actually, like, that's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, to further on that, to continue, pardon me, that particular line of thinking. Um, the horror, the darkness doesn't really care whether you're one type of person or another. It's no. going to be preying upon everyone regardless. Mm. Um, and that's something you can do to help undermine many of the standard tropes that um, are prevalent through real life examples of darkness. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons I quite enjoy it, because it allows you to plunge down into the darkness and the horror Um gain yourself a whole host of experiences you'd never have in real life but with that safety barrier of it being a game of it being a movie of it being uh whatever it is you happen to be engaging with um so you can still get a lot of those same visceral responses um mm -hmm. right down to the adrenaline bursts in some cases when you're like holy shit this is ah um <clears throat> which you don't get from your higher fantasy equivalents you mm -hmm. get a completely different rush so to speak um, where mm -hmm. on the dark side, you most certainly can get that. Plus, you can get all the other things too 
because dark fantasy is not just about focusing on those things. It's about showing all of that darkness in contrast to the other things as well. It's one of the reasons I like yeah. dark fantasy in particular, because it allows you to move through more genres, so to speak, than you yeah. might be able to do so um, with, say, a higher version of fantasy. Yeah, that, that's absolutely it. And when you find yourself um, kind of doing darkness for the sake of darkness with no contrast, that's when you need to check yourself because that's when you're getting close to the edge. Yeah, and I think it wasn't for me about having characters who didn't have struggles and didn't face like hard things to overcome. You know, in that case, that character that I ended up playing like joined a cult which canon wise is dominated by men so we had to have a discussion about well of course you can join because you know like you're a hero and you were blessed by this god but but there will be discussions that you have in character and it wasn't about that it wasn't about not you know just your character having an easy life it was about specifically a gm exercising their power which i've seen online people complain about people doing say right well your character is x which means you won't be able to go into that city y rather than saying right you're going to need to go in via an underground route and there's people who can help you and then when you get in it'll be quite interesting because you'll see a different part of the city than other people um yeah so just creativity in storytelling i think hmm. I, I find it a particularly prevalent argument, actually, amongst Warhammer players in general. Um, and it was something I was very keen to undermine when uh, a lot of my writing, which was that Warhammer was all about playing the grubby people at the bottom, where mm. for me, the horror and the darkness and the grim and the perilous affected everyone. Right. And just because you happen to be playing a noble or a wizard or something that's on the more high fantasy side, that in no way... Uh, changes the fact that you're playing a game that is a dark fantasy um, and it may look like from the outside particularly if you just say a description of we're playing a wizard and a and and a hero and a this and a that that in no way changes the real life experience of those characters hmm. mm. yeah. smiling tom says what part do you think is hardest to balance the border between grounded and depressing or between grim and generic horror with axes or option c one that you tell me about <laughs> I never found people when they're playing characters um, and not just playing base stereotypes, but when you're playing a character um, and they are confronted with horror, they tend to react in a particular way, tend to try and alleviate it. They tend to themselves engage with the material and bring it to a new place. Um, so the horror that the border there, for example, between grounded and depressing or grim and generic, and I find them, I, I find all of them a bit too categorized. Mm. Um, I, I don't feel that there is really borders that lay between any of these things. I'd say the, the bigger problem for me is the, um, the interesting and the uninteresting, the things yeah. that engage and the things that do not engage. And sometimes the most depressing and grounded thing can be the thing that's most exciting. But equally, sometimes the thing that is horrific and dark and is looming out of the darkness can be the most exciting. It's all about context and the characters at hand. Um, so I find it a very difficult line to take from that perspective. It's more about the characters and the story being told. I mean, I think, like for me, like from a writing perspective, perhaps, there, there's more of a discussion to be had there because I think it is something that I know certainly you and I, Andy, when we've been discussing what we're putting in a location, say, um, has been that 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 need to to have something that that stops it being in, like entirely depressing um, because if it was entirely depressing. Like everybody would just give up. Like, like you know, like there would be what's the what's yeah. the point in our party carrying on if everything is definitely going to die? There has to be that little sliver yeah. of of kind of hope that that you know, and it may be a fool's hope, and it may be, and and I think I suppose that the the, the difference is try and try and think like if you think of it in like Star Wars terms, right? Like in a dark fantasy, you're never going to get the end of a New Hope where da -da -da -da, and there's medals and fanfare, and it's it's never going to be like that. But you might win and save the day but in doing so you have somehow compromised something else um, or compromised yourself or... Yes, yeah. exactly. That, exactly. That, that, yeah. that you may have won but have you won? Um, um, and like that 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 is, yeah. is better whereas if it's like whatever happens you lose that's depressing yeah. whereas if you can win but at what cost do you win that's dark fantasy to, to me but 
Yeah, um, that's actually, it. The purpose is not to win. The purpose is to not lose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, actually, going on to Star Wars, I think Star Wars is a really interesting thing to look at in general because sometimes mm. it goes very dark. Um, just take, for example, um, spoilers for Star Wars, um, Anakin killing loads of children. That's mm. really freaking grim. Or um, his, his best friend cutting his arms and legs off and leaving him to burn in lava. That too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a proper dark grimness that um, uh, lies through it. Yet very few people would refer to Star yeah. Wars as being a particularly dark fantasy. E even even in the first one, even in a, in a New Hope, right? Like poor um, like uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, right? <laughs> like their little little burned corpses. Like everybody forgets that shot in the original Star Wars. Those little black and charred corpses up against the burnt out farm building, like or yeah, even, and it's or like, even... like, like stormtroopers gonna hit them. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Or even like when hold hold them down. <laughs> <laughs> or even Leia gets taken away, and she's clearly she gets tortured. It happens off screen, oh, yeah. but make no mistake, she's being tortured. That's right. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. grim. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, agreed. Um, mm -hmm. And in many respects, they're oh. the parts that I enjoy working with and writing and drilling down. But one of the reasons mm -hmm. that it works is because Star Wars has such high comparisons contrasts between its darkness and its lightness um mm -hmm. indeed that's a primary three theme of the entire setting in some regards um and oh wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly that when exactly I, that. <laughs> when I, yeah. was, I must have been in like primary one which for people who are not scottish is like five or six and I, i've said this before i went to a tiny village school so there was basically one girl who stayed for school lunches the rest of them went home so i always got to be leia in the playground and like there would be han solo and chewbacca and someone would be luke and pretty much because it was such a small school you had the whole cast of star wars but that bit like we would basically act out star wars every single day every single lunchtime but that bit where like i had to go off and be tortured it was really funny because nobody knew what to do <laughs> so i would just be like taken around the side of the building and like left there for a bit because it all happens <laughs> off screen it wasn't, it wasn't very like five-year-olds they just didn't mm. really get it no. <laughs> well, nor should they <laughs> nor should no, they, nor should they. <laughs> But yeah. looking back on it, it was just like fade to black, cut, cut away. Let's get on yeah. to the next bit of this. Movie. Right. Also, I think you know the um, the humour that is inherent in a lot of dark fantasy, whether it's satire or slapstick or whatever it is, uh, that's really necessary to uh, both alleviate the darkness, provide that contrast, so the darkness means something but also to um, stop it just becoming a depressing quagmire. And, yeah, to, uh, to take yeah, all the things lead. It's building oh, tension, isn't it? It's narrative stuff. It's building the tension. You have to, you have to allow a little moment of, of, of relief before you yeah. wrap it up. Before, you know, mm -hmm. it, exactly. It I think it's something that Pulp Fiction did beautifully um, when it's all going yes. through its worst parts and then bang, the gun goes off and yeah. blows the guy's head off. Oh, by oh. And then later on with the, Poor you're Marvin. the one on motherfucking brain duty. Um, yeah. And little lines like that interspersed yeah. with abject horror. That's um, right. But the reason the horror is so horrific is because you were laughing just a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. Um, if you hadn't had that laugh and it was just one big, long, dreary fest, um, mm. by the end of the movie, you'd be depressed and it'd be sad instead of going, well, that was a really mm. clever piece of entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's and it's it's not new. I mean, like the Porter scene in Macbeth do, does exactly that, right? You've just yeah. had this moment of, of high tension um, and then you get somebody coming out and telling a bunch of kind of jokes about erectile dysfunction um, and then and then back into the, the high tension again. So, yeah. 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 Hmm. <clears throat> um, so what's next one, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, my streamyard. Can you hear me? Because yeah. my streamyard yeah. is telling me it's. Yeah, really I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so, um, Thank you. Roderick has asked the Rookery avoids going full Snyder with their dark fantasy by using comedy. Can you give examples of other dark fantasies that you think should have done that too, uh, and how? <laughs> That's Roderick being a bit naughty. Uh, <laughs> that question. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> hmm. Um, oh, Lindsay's. Gone. I mean, I approve of the term full Snyder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, are there other any dark fantasies that are too dark, too serious? Need, um, need I'm going to take your I mean, example. 
Uh -huh. uh, I'll take your example and say that FromSoft games are sort of extraordinary and really very good, but they are unrelieving. Um, mm -hmm. And they're unrelieving in so many ways, and that's part of its theme. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be. Um, they're unrelievingly difficult. They're unrelieving in death. They're unrelieving in that constant churn um, of uh, your attempts to gain XP. Um, but the bleakness and the darkness and the next gribbly and the next gribbly um, mm. it reaches the point where by number four you kind of don't care what it looks like all you're mm. really interested in is what's the path to defeating it yeah. um, and yeah. you start to lose the horror of it all um, mm. because it's just another step and another step and another step mm. take that in comparison to another game I mentioned previously say Darkest Dungeon and we're all the way through. There's lots of very clever little lines that are dropped by the narrator. There's often some very funny lines dropped by the narrator. Um, and that not only grounds you into the story narratively, you understand that there's this constant pressure of the story pushing forwards and a sort of time limit that sticks behind it. Um, but it also provides some contrast for that darkness to be set. Oh, the, the, the purple prose in Darkest Dungeon is, is one of the best things about the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And, and it's what really makes that game come to life. It's how it managed to hold onto its darkness without the darkness being mm -hmm. lost. Where, say, for example, Elden Ring, which came out recently, an amazing game on so many levels, but it is so unrelieving um, that it sort of loses its tension. Its best contrast is galloping around in the middle of nowhere and making your horse goat jump around a bit because that's kind of funny. Um, and and whilst that is kind of funny, and sometimes it can be very amusing as you miss yet again, as you're swiping away, um, that when the humour is only coming from the player and their engagement with the game, or if the lightness to contrast against the dark is only coming from the player, it can sometimes make the experience as a whole tougher to deal with. Nevertheless, still very well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, enjoyed like... Elden Ring, but sorry, Andy. No, no, on you go. It's fine. But it was really difficult to find a story in it, yeah. like, and and I think that was less about the unrelieving nature of it and just about I, I don't know the game design and the story just seemed to kind of like fritter away. And I was like, hang on, wait a minute, is there a story I'm supposed to be following? I've just run round like stabbing people and having my kids laugh at me because I fell off something again <laughs> for the fifty <laughs> millionth time. Yeah, it's a story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Freaking yeah, hilarious I've... though. I, I I have strongly negative opinions about the the story writing in, in Elden Ring, but I don't want to I don't want to yuck other people's yum, so I won't I won't get into that. Um, but I guess an, another pop culture example of of this is it, Battlestar Galactica. Like I've I've talked a lot about this. Like the first season, particularly Battlestar Galactica, managed that well. Like it it was grim because of course it was right. Like a civilization was almost entirely wiped out. Of course that was serious, but there were little moments of levity in there. Right, mm -hmm. a lot of it was Baltar with with head six, and you know there, there was like li yeah. little funny moments where people walked in just after, and he was all in a all all a fluster. Um, but at least there was that humor. But then as it went on, they just stopped doing those scenes, and it just became a slog. It was just like. Mm -hmm getting punched in the gut every week and ooh spaceships and then punched in the gut and ooh spaceships and just you know i i, th I think it was less satisfying as a, mm. as a narrative in the, in the second half without we even get to the dreadful dreadful finale but yeah uh. um, hey, David. we should we should do a whole we should do a shit post stream where we just talk about bad endings oh yeah <laughs> badly but, written david, well, we <laughs> go up, about that one. <laughs> yeah. david says Key elements of dark fantasy for me are one, the moment the players suddenly realise that it was their fault hmm. and two, yes. the moment the NPC that all the players have fallen in love with is suddenly killed because they didn't get the bad guy or in my case the NPC that I have fallen in love with turns out to be the bad yeah. guy <laughs> oh, again <laughs> Yeah <laughs> I thought you were going um, with the time the NPC we really liked was eaten by a wyvern. That's the one I thought you were going oh, for. Oh, <laughs> that was awful. Or, that or the other really time the NPC we really liked turned out to be possessed by the greater demon that we were hunting. Uh, <laughs> that was awful. Yeah, that was wow. not either. I, I'm going to reinforce and completely agree with this, and um, but it's rather less specifically and more generally. The, the tone of those is something that I think is super important. And in some respects, I feel, for example, when we were discussing the enemy within, it was very important for me that that moment was there in many places and i feel that it isn't in some places and it uh, could do with um a, a dark fantasy stab in a few places because i think it is exactly that the point when the players go oh my god we did this 
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's just a beautiful piece. Mm. Um, uh, or the the bit where they go, this really good thing that we've done, uh, is it? Mm. Um, and exactly how that unfolds, uh, I I agree completely. I love that. Yeah, consequences. Yeah. It's what you were saying early earlier, Andy mm. Leafs. Like, mm -hmm. have have we won? Did. Uh, yeah. what cost? Yeah. Hans, yeah. Are, are we the baddies? Uh, <laughs> that, that, that one yeah, yeah, and there's also that that sort of heads I win, tails you lose kind of dynamic where you may think you've solved the problem, you've taken out the bad guy, but actually you were working for the bad guy all along, and uh, you've taken out someone either innocent or good who could have prevented and now you've got to stop the real bad guy and uh, yeah mm -hmm. all, all of that the uh, the misdirection and the fact that no good deed goes unpunished yeah, yeah quite no good deed goes unpunished that always makes things a little bit on the darker side mm -hmm. <laughs> um can i also just make a small comment that uh, i'm being told that twitch users may be getting some stutters if that's the case we apologize nothing we can do about that if you find that you're having any issues at your end just pop over to youtube it's definitely streaming there clean just in case mm. yeah and of course after we finish the uh the whole show will be up on youtube video on demand whenever you care to look at it totally <clears throat> So here is another one. Um, when isn't fantasy dark? Susan Henny Yukimi asks. Mm. When, when it's light? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for me, any Mercedes Lackey book. Has anyone read those? They're just so pure. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me, um, th there's most fantasies actually dabble in darkness all over the place. We were discussing mm. Star Wars earlier, which for all that is sci-fi is basically a fantasy with wizards and so oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and it constantly dabbles in the darkness. In fact, I would argue it delves deep into it um, and often moves through dark fantasy territory. Um, mm. So I would say most fantasies to a degree do dabble here. But when isn't it dark? When it always, and you know it's always going to come out good in the end. Yeah. Then you know it's not dark. When you know mm. the heroes can't die. Yeah. When you know that everything will, uh, no matter what the individual characters are like, They'll all be good at heart. Yeah, um, and when the when think... the sort of default in the civilization is that most people are nice and good and true and honest, yeah. you know, as opposed to most people are out for themselves mm -hmm. and and will screw you over if that will make their lives better. Like it's it's that sort of base state of the universe, isn't it? Do you mm. think Stardust is dark fantasy? Like we watched it the other day, the film, and and there's quite a lot of elements in it that are just like you know, like the ghosts, and they're all like murdering each other. But then there's so much in it that's just like, oh, but that's so sweet. Like it's gonna work out okay in the end. But like what I do think, you think? I think that's because Neil Gaiman. Because I think you could apply that to almost everything by Neil Gaiman, and I think he mm. balances right on the knife edge between the two. Cause, mm -hmm. And I think that's why he's so good. Um, is because. He, he is able to have the sense of jeopardy you might expect from dark fantasy, but yet also have the comfort and reassurance of the fact that on some level things might be okay. I mean, you know, uh, uh, hands down for me, the most disturbing villain I, I have ever encountered in, in literature is the, the Corinthian from the, the Sandman books. Um, yeah, like so, and not just, I mean, the visuals are incredibly distressing in and of themselves, but just who, who that character is and what they represent um, is so, so chilling. And yet, so much of that is also lovely and <laughs> sweet and, and dreamlike and yeah yeah. Um. yeah so when is it fantasy dark when it's all light yeah mm. that's a good one yeah. um is lord when, of the rings dark fantasy mm. no. yeah when it's when it's, there's no moral <laughs> ambiguity when it's all black and white and there's no shades of gray or anything yeah, there's, there's yeah, Lord of the Rings. Is that there's it's clearly defined uh, between good and evil. There aren't. There, I mean, there's Grima Wormtongue, and is, is the only character I immediately think that that it is fully rounded, you know, and that in that. Yeah. But I mean, it does deal with with you know addiction and and um, uh, um, it's not a happy ending, not really, not for Frodo. No. Um, so if oh, it's, I mean, but it's not. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'd never think of it as dark fantasy because it doesn't really. It, 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 you know, it's sort of there's a there's a there's dabbles of 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 darkness in there, but it's fairly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly high fantasy. 
Mm. I guess. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say, Mark. Definitely yeah. high fantasy. But Darker Days, I can't believe we, you and I didn't talk about this, Graham. I think it's because Stardust is really a fairy tale. So sure, there are dark that's, elements, but things do work yeah. out. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. classic that's dark true. fantasy is a fairy tale. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for for my money, Neil Gaiman writes more in the uh, the modern fairy tale genre than in pure fantasy. Yep, agreed. <clears throat> Yeah. I agreed with this as well. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah, dark absolutely. fantasy may be more about personal horror rather than external threats. For example, my current Woofer PC is struggling with feeling of inadequacy, guilt, and a gambling addiction. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, welcome to Warhammer, kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's, and it's yeah. often. Oh, well, go, go for it. Um, no, I was just going to. You know, agree with that at some more greater length. Just saying that that the horror can is more authentic in a way when it comes from within rather than without. Yeah, it's it's the realization yeah. as well, I, I and mean, the combination. <laughs> I, I have a I have a shades of grey view in this general area because the the horror from without for me is as important um, sometimes mm. as the horror from within, um, yeah. and. To focus on only one is to almost do a disservice to the other. Oh, oh, absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. For for me, but mm. uh, yeah, yeah. For me, it's it's dark fantasy is at its best when the horror without kind of forces a character to confront the horror within. Yeah, and now we're going somewhere. Mm. Um, it it doesn't need to be that, uh, but at its best, it it does that. Yes. Mm. Um, Here's so, one from Vagrant. Yeah. Um, what element style makes for effective dark fantasy art? Skulls! What do you think? This is, this, is, this, is a, this is a poll we need to have. Skulls or spikes? It could be the new pirates and ninjas. <laughs> Skulls on spikes. Yes. Or candles. Mm. <laughs> spikes or candles. Yeah. Skulls or candles. Oh, skulls or candles? No, definitely skulls in. Sorry, candles in skulls. Candles in skulls. Oh, yeah. oh, candles in skulls. Yeah. With, yeah. with cobwebs on the side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we wrote those directly into the well of bones. So yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Entire bodies with candles inside them, <laughs> used as lanterns. Yeah, good yeah. times. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that really answers the question. No. <laughs> no, not really. No. Um, I would say kind of sorry mark i'm going to talk about art but oh, I'm no, no, nothing but I'm but there. yeah there we are desaturate the image i mean darkness actual darkness for one thing but also um an accurate depiction of things like danger and injuries and you know it's not a uh, triumphal frazetta or uh, whatever uh, and I'm now babbling. Serves me right for trying to talk about art. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting you say Frazetta because uh, uh, I think I think Frazetta had a lot of dark stuff. I mean, I would say yeah. your Boris Vallejo's tended As, to be you're absolutely right. Yeah, muscled, oiled, uh, uh, yeah, high stuff. Frazetta often got no. Art. You're absolutely right. I got that yeah. precisely backwards. But it's um. Uh, yeah, um, yes, it's the thematic stuff, uh, elements, um, dark fantasy art, yeah, sort of sort of shadowy, unknown, uh, stuff that sort of you know hints at, at, at horror and stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be, um, um, um brightly displayed, it's it's kind of a uns any, anything that's sort of thematically unsettling, to yeah. Me. Yeah. That, that, that's exactly what I was going to say because what I immediately thought when I first saw we were talking about dark fantasy the first thing I went to and it's funny it's again it's probably more of a fairy tale element actually but it was Pan's Labyrinth you know the Guillermo mm -hmm. del Toro film and like the the design of like the of the eyeless man and, and everything and there's just something like I know it's Doug Jones inside that and I know he's a really nice guy and I've seen him interviewed a lot and I've seen behind the scenes things but yet that image is, is yeah. remains really disturbing um, it's, yeah it's just so clearly wrong yeah yeah um and and it is it's hard. i guess it's a thing about art that it can sometimes like shortcut um to to the sensation 
Um, you know, so it's not a rational thing. You don't look at a picture, process it rationally, and go, "This is how I'm going to feel about it." I, w- I was at a, um, an exhibition last week, actually, and there was a, a visual artist um, in in a room that sort of had an installation, and I went in, and, and within a second, like I was almost having a panic attack. It was so distressing. I couldn't tell you why. Um, there was nothing, no recognizable shapes in the montage that was playing, but it was. I, th- I think that's what the artist was going for. I think it was meant to be like that, um, but it was very unsetting. So I think that the the power of art to contribute to that kind of moods is is absolutely crucial. I think. Yeah, for me, I, I agree completely, and it's that oppressive danger, the sense that things are unsettled mm. and could go very, very wrong, um, which generally requires something to be yeah. right. So you need to have something to go horribly wrong with. There's a big difference between an open door with a shadow and an open door with a shadow and a child looking into it. Um, Because suddenly you've got that sense of what's lying in there. And if you've got the hint of what might be in there and that child's about to step in, suddenly you get that rush of, oh, something's going to go wrong. Um, And the the darkness needs something like that. a, A nicely example there from Long Shadow Games suggesting the smiling face, and then you see that underneath it, it's all severed, yet they're still smiling. Um, there's something clearly wrong there, and it's that sense of wrongness, the uneasiness, that for me um, really grounds dark fantasy in, at its best. Um, just having something that exists for the sake of existing is less g- good dark fantasy, but it could be super awesome. And it's trying to find the nice place in between, I find. Not Blood Bowl. (laughs) (laughs) No, not Blood Bowl. But I do like my popcorn. I love Blood Bowl. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, like it's it's great. But they certainly have taken like things that are dark fantasy and really like Yeah. Lightened them up a bit. Yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay, Kilishandra asks hopefully this will come up for me if you could take over any dark fantasy game or setting and make it your own which would you take Hmm. (laughs) i don't know i mean i think as we sort of discussed before i would rather make our own right (laughs) we're we're making our own dark fantasy setting that's that's why why polish someone else's when we've we've got our own you know Um, that may be a cop out but that's my answer Yeah. See, there's a big difference between working on somebody else's setting and yeah. making it your own. There is. When you work on somebody else's setting, what you're typically doing is sitting within a, a cage, a framework that has already been created by somebody else. And there's often somebody standing over it saying, don't go outside these lines. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's a big difference between, say, something that we've all done, working on Warhammer, and then working on Warhammer and making it our own. Exactly. Um, so would I like to do that? Sure, that would be awesome, but it's never going to happen. Um, and I find thinking about things that I would love to do but can't quite distressing for my own personal psyche because yeah. I look at something and go, why isn't it that? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so I think in many respects that says how we got to here when we're all doing our own stuff. Mm. Um, exactly, yeah. I've ended up in the same place as Andy, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> Fun, yeah funny that yeah. thanks for that andy it's but it's it's true it's exactly how we all ended up you know where we are now doing what we're doing um i mean i guess maybe an angle to look at the question from would be uh what have you wished you could have fixed um and something that comes to my mind it's contemporary urban fantasy but it had a darkness to it It was a television series called grim from a few years ago Mm -hmm. and um that started off very promising but like so many fantasy and science Mm. fiction series it got crushed under the weight of its own growing mythology and uh for my money that absolutely ruined it plus they they started inventing their own folklore when there's perfectly good folklore to be had which uh, you know is tried and tested and uh, um, so that would be one thing that uh, if I could yeah. take anything and make it my own I would like to fix Grimm 
Uh, apologies just, to uh, people who love it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to come back to the previous one about art and Long Shadow Games is the comedian's death scene and the reasons for it in Watchmen with a smiley face badge falling with a drop of blood on the surface. That's dark and really cinematic. I totally agree. And actually Watchmen mm. is such a good example of like dark fantasy superhero stuff. I, I hadn't, I don't think Andy Law, I don't think I'd read it when I watched the film. So you had read it, I hadn't. We went and watched the film and the whole of the introduction with, is it um, times they are a changing? By the end of that intro, I was literally in like tears streaming down my face because in, that, that has never happened to me in a film before because I thought it was so perfectly pitched in the sense that the stuff happening in Watchmen would never happen in our world. Obviously, there are superheroes, there's Dr. Manhattan, blah, 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 blah. But actually, like the gut punch of of the 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 woman being murdered because she's a lesbian after her like coming out and it being so beautiful. I was just like, this is all like so real and so what our world like would have been like and and can be like without these superheroes that I just felt felt really distraught <laughs> so i think like yeah. that dark fantasy superhero making me reflect on like even although there isn't those bad things there are all there are bad things in our world was just perfect and sad and dark and well, some would think... say that that montage was the last good things that snyder did but anyway <laughs> 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 yeah the rest of the film whatever take it or leave it but that montage like yeah that montage gold it affected yeah, me really good. more than any I mean, opening of a film has yeah. ever affected me before i'm, I'm not i'm not going to get into it we're, we're not we're not analyzing the watchman half <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, box, yeah in, in the boys darker days radio we andy law and i talk about this quite a lot that the boys taps into that quite well the boys depressingly is how i feel that real life would go if there were superheroes yeah i agree yeah sadly yes sadly yeah yeah and that makes it less dark fantasy and more just depressing reality mm. with well, superheroes that's... added yeah well that brings us back really to the first question with what is dark fantasy and you you just really put your finger on it there Lindsay. it's it's how our world would be if there were orcs and wizards and stuff that, yeah i think and i think referencing the boys it is it, it this it, it's the counter it is the dark fantasy counterpoint to your avengers and your superman superman to, to, to what marvel generally speaking wants us to to, to, to look at and imagine as, as mm. the, uh, the sort of the uh, aspirational her heroes of, of the yeah, superhero exactly. Fandex world, the boys is kind of like actually this is this is what it would be it'd be more like that and Peacemaker, of course. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So I feel the boys is dark satire. Absolutely. I don't think yeah. it's dark yeah. fantasy. It's not. It's set in you know in, yeah. in present day. Well, but, yeah, but, but dark still, fantasy, yeah. fantasy is dark right? satire. Yeah. It's, yeah, still, fan it's a... still a fantasy. Yeah. I, I feel there's a very permeable barrier between uh, dark fantasy and dark satire. Yeah, me too. You know, it's it's yeah. the and that's what gives it its darkness. Really, it gives us that 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 sort of real world thing to relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's about the human condition. Yeah, exactly. Ultimately, um, mm. and where many fantasies stray far from the human condition and just go straight into um, big shiny things and being effectively superheroes in a fantasy um, environment. Um, they they lose they lose touch with what people actually do, yeah, and how they do react, and the fact that we are imperfect, mm. and and react very differently to certain situations. And if you give people ultimate power, some people, a lot of people, will use it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm off on one now. I've got all manner of thoughts <laughs> running through my head. Yeah. Let's not go down that route. Um, so which no. one would I fix? Um, I'd fix the end of Game of Thrones. There we go. There was a dark, <laughs> there was oh, a dark wow. fantasy that was building up really well in terms mm. of the TV show. I'm not talking about the books. I have mm. different issues with the books. Yeah, the, the, book, the books show, don't have an ending as yet. Um, <laughs> indeed, nor be it ever. Um, <laughs> but the, the TV L show... Lots of descriptions of meals and nipples, though. So, <laughs> the, Yeah, I mean, who doesn't like a mealy nipple? Wait, what? Um, but, uh, but the TV uh, show um, was going up, 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 and then about halfway through went down, 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 as it lost its grounding in reality. Hmm. Um, mm. When it no longer had books to be based upon, they no longer worried about things like how long does it take to get from A to B? Um, <laughs> how exactly does this creature fly or anything else? So there was no 
there was no touch to reality and that touch got further and further away um mm. and to make matters even worse they spun a whole bunch of story points and didn't then conclude them mm -hmm. Um, so you were left with an ultimately unsatisfying and conclusion. The the worst thing about yeah. that, and again, I won't I won't go off on too long about this, but the worst thing about that was that it was by design. So I heard on a podcast, um, the guys. It wasn't one of the two showrunners, but it was the guy who was like the lead writer in the writers' room for that final season. Um, and and he himself still still feels that the way that you write a thing like that is you just concentrate on the cool moments and you don't worry about how you get from A to B. Just throw all the cool bits on the screen and it'll be fine. And you're like, that's literally the problem with that season. Can, can you not see? But he did it deliberately. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an oversight. It wasn't they run out of yeah. budget. He he wrote it that way. That's what he yeah. wanted it to be like. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. Each 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 to their own. I would obviously yeah. have I don't, I don't know anybody that thinks it's good. <laughs> I'm not I, a single person. Well, I, I was once working on a, a video game adaptation of a, a movie series that never came out. Um and I was told that very same thing. And I think there's a, a great tendency in uh in Hollywood and in the movie and TV industry to uh, to just assume that, oh, the audience is all idiots. Just give them things to go wow at and it'll be fine. And I think, and I fantasy for, for, for plenty of, of, uh, of movie going uh, and, and TV shows, I think that's probably the case. Well, you yeah. Can't spend, you can't spend five seasons building up something to be great and then, and then pulling the legs out from underneath it and expect yeah. people to go, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, if it was all like that, that would have been different. If, if, if the whole trash, series was... I yeah. would have embraced it as complete trash. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Game of Thrones is an interesting one, right? Because when, when Game of Thrones first was made, um, you know, I was the only person at work, not among my friend group, obviously, but at work who had read Game of Thrones, who knew about what Game of Thrones was, who was into it, who knew what happened, you know, in the first season. And then by the, by, like, as it moved on, more and more and more people who hadn't read the source material and weren't really into dark fantasy or, or had, had just kind of been absorbed in this cultural phenomenon. And mm. I think to a certain extent, it did suffer for that. Oh, I think but so. It got, too, yeah. yeah, not too popular, but it was so popular and so much pressure to to kind of just wrap it up. I don't know. Who yeah, knows? I think we were discussing this earlier as well. When you when you create art with the desire to simply please, you'll end up mm. with art that doesn't do things like say the end of Romeo and Juliet. I won't give spoilers yeah. um, because, you know, you might not have seen it yet. <laughs> um, the whole point of Romeo and Juliet is you find out the ending literally 14 lines in because the, the prologue what? is a sonnet. So That's true. <laughs> it, tell, it tells you the whole story in the first 14 lines of the play. <laughs> Nevertheless, if that was a Hollywood movie, it would not be made like that unless they were directly making that movie today. Um, and that in And therein lies all manner of potential discussions to be had because one isn't necessarily better than the other but you definitely end up stymieing your art if you only go for a single target mm. and i think that the game of thrones went for a different target to the target that was set up in the first half of its um uh, run right um yeah. they aimed for a different target to conclude it and some people i presume must have loved that as an ending but it didn't do it for me mm. i mean if there are i haven't met them um, yeah. <laughs> and I've, and I've tried honestly i've spoken to a lot of people about game of thrones I've yet to meet anybody who liked that last season everybody disagrees about when it went off the rails exactly but everybody agrees it was definitely a crash by the end so um, yeah. yeah i just <laughs> want to bring up roderick's question because i do think he deserves a little bit of credit for his pizza cutter so how do we make sure yeah, our dark fantasy doesn't end up as a pizza cutter all edge no point and stays welcoming to all <laughs> for me the same I'm way you make that. sure yeah, yeah, I know. It's about the same way you make everything welcoming, welcoming to all. Don't be a dick. Listen to your players. Listen to people. Listen to playtesters. And just don't confuse dark fantasy with imposing with your, your power suffer. fantasy. With yeah. making your players suffer or imposing power fantasies on people. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, you know, you want to avoid it being all edge, no point, is you just make sure you've got a point. I mean, I know that's yeah. easier said than done, perhaps, but but the thing we were saying at the start about whether it was like a satire or like a dystopia or like like ha having some issue or some reason there has to be a reason for the darkness it's not yeah. just there for us all to to be to be 
Miserable. depressed and, by. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and to reinforce that, that that reason could be supernatural and crazy and mm -hmm. over the top, and its manifestations could be mm -hmm. truly awesome in the most mm -hmm literal sense of the word awesome but that doesn't mean that the metaphor that you're spinning mm. doesn't ground itself in a very firm real reality um yeah. ensuring that there is a point for that thing existing not necessarily in game but most certainly out of game yeah ha have it hold a light to the human condition as, as has been said earlier and you can't go mm -hmm. far wrong yeah agreed. absolutely and on that note we come to the end of our stream mm. That just flashed by. Oh, that whoosh! It did, didn't it? Yeah. Yep. Um, thank you, um, fellow rooks, and thank you to the audience for popping in your comments and your questions. Awesome, as always. Um, next week, we have got Bob Naismith coming on to talk about um, what is he Making talking about, miniatures. Andy? Making, talking miniatures. About making miniatures yeah yes. totally yeah bob for those of you who don't know uh ran the miniatures department at games workshop in the 80s he designed the space marines he designed the warlord titan he was pivotal in getting the transition from all metal to some plastic and uh he, he he's done pretty much everything involving miniatures Brilliant. Thank you for that, Graham, that little yeah, well, intro sneak peek to next week. But until then, um, have a good Saturday and we'll see you all next week for another episode of Inside the Rookery. Bye. All. Bye. Bye.